The reason I wanted to just touch on the Tony Benn issue is just to look at the left-right thing for a minute, because uh, your personal experience, when you announced that you were standing for um, the Brexit Party, I'm laughing because I was on Sky News papers that night and there was a, a Sun article about Nigel Farage's communist. <laughs> and there was lots of stuff like that. The commie standing for the Brexit Party and, and why is this radical left winger standing for this kind of people call uh, uh, Nigel Farage far right, which is completely and utterly incorrect. But uh, you get the gist. So one of the things I thought that was quite important about what you did, and, and this is not just a romantic argument, but one of the uh, things I thought was important about the role that you played and, and other left-leaning or, or traditionally leftist Eurosceptics, I think one of the important roles that they played was just a reminder that this wasn't, Euroscepticism wasn't necessarily an eccentric right-wing phenomenon that was only existent in the 1922 committee and among conservative societies, Oxford University, but it actually was a mass sentiment and a mass sentiment in particular among former mining communities and in parts of Wales and in parts of the north of England and in parts of Essex and in, you know, the more working class suburbs of London. So um, did you feel a responsibility to make that argument? Did you f find yourself feeling that it was important, you know, not to self-consciously distance yourself from right-wing Brexiteers, but to bring in the argument for uh, a more working class mass traditionally leftist view of um, anti-European Union sentiment. So before the Brexit party, I think one of the things that was discussed quite a lot during that three and a half years before the European elections or the Brexit party even existed was this attempt at suggesting that the Leave vote had been, a, you know, contrived by some far right cabal um, and that had kind of, you know, whipped up a xenophobia amongst working class people. So there was a distancing that went on from, of leave from any left wing roots. And that was true. And that, that was well and truly being cemented. But the interesting thing about it was, was that only just the year before the uh, referendum was called, people like Owen Jones, who actually was the person who came up with the phrase Lexit. Yeah had actually, you know, to my surprise, I agree with him on this one, had said, you know, after what the EU has done to Greece in terms of its imposition of austerity, we've got to have a Lexit movement. And, you know, people like these left-wing commentators, I mean, it's laughable to say it now, you know, Paul Mason, what? <laughs> um, but anyway, these kind of people were sort of, but there was actually quite a lot of them were saying, yeah. you know, we, we, we need to really gather around. And so when the referendum was called, I think there was an interesting moment there because I thought that the left would be more enthusiastic yeah. in terms of the referendum. But as we know, they they lost their bottle. And yeah. I hardly need repeat the cliche now of uh, Jeremy Corbyn being a kind of great and articulate exponent of a Tony Benn-like clarity. I mean, Jeremy Corbyn is more articulate on the EU and its failings if you look at the films over the years, than on almost anything we've heard him say subsequently. You know what I mean? I mean, it's sort of very peculiar that as the leader of the opposition, he kind of copped out in that way. But anyway, that's all kind of history. So when, when it came to that European election, I think the main thing was, was that I just felt that, and I mean, I wasn't certainly the only one, that there was just the beginnings of the bubbling up. I think the betrayal had got so bad that some of the more left-leaning Leavers who'd been a bit quiet, if we're honest, for the three and a half years, like the trade unionists and, and these kind of things, were just beginning to kind of bubble up again. You know, that we, I'm a great admirer of the full Brexit, which are those kind of lefty, left leaning academics who set up that website. There were sort of left Brexit meetings happening. I'd been to a few of them. And, you know, people like that trade unionist, Daddy Dempsey, and people like this were just just speaking out. And there was just mm. a bit like even some of the Novara media, Aaron Bastani, Grace Blakely, people like this were just sort of saying, actually, we do have to accept that leaving the EU could be a positive thing for the working class. You know, there was a bit of that going on. Uh, Costas Lapovitas, mm. Lapovitas, who you've interviewed on Spike. So these kind of things were happening. When the European elections came along, I just, I suppose I really didn't want the Brexit party to be UKIP Mark II. Yeah. But the other thing was, was that, Nigel Farage didn't want the yeah. Brexit party to be UKIP Mark II. So you could say, I didn't want it to be, but I had no intentions of standing. I just wanted him to find people that, who would stand, who would show that those who voted leave 
cut across the left-right divide, but also across the class divide. I mean, you know, i.e. across ethnicities, you know, represented all sorts of people. And I, I really wanted prominent left-wing figures to emerge who would stand for the Brexit party. And it was quite difficult because it became obvious that wasn't going to happen. And, you know, they'd asked me and I'd said no. And I was also frightened of my reputation. And you've got to think that, you know, whether we like it or not, Nigel Farage has a toxic reputation. And it's not that I think he deserves it. Mm. He's sailed close to the wind and on occasions done things and said things which I deplore. But broadly speaking, he doesn't deserve the reputation he's got. But nonetheless, you know, it was kind of, oh, God, Nigel Farage, you know. But I didn't want it to be a Nigel Farage Brexit party. And like I say, he had at least, to be his credit, thought he wanted to gather... So I thought in the end, God, if I'm going to say I want somebody to stand on the left, then I yeah. better do it. However, I didn't really go in saying I'm on the left. Yeah. I mean, I did say that, I think, when I spoke, but I wasn't thinking that was going to be a dominant feature. I mean, it became a attempt at delegitimizing me standing that my liberal left peers, particularly in the media, decided to deploy against me as a way of saying that I was a lunatic and a far left extremist he wanted to go back to a party that i was in 20 years ago but had closed 20 years ago the revolutionary communist party <laughs> cite everything that had ever been published in any publication that i'd ever sold on a street when i was 20 or 21 or 22 i'm not trying to decry those things but mm. it wasn't as though i walked around saying do you know i'm a revolutionary yeah. communist party in every single interview i've done people have said well revolutionary communist party to brexit party and i've said yeah but there was a 20 plus year gap. It wasn't like, so, you, know, you know, people just have forgotten that for the last 20 years, many people on the left and right, if left and right have become complicated phrases, you know, free speech, is that a left or a right wing thing? You know, is it left wing to be green when you're into arguing for eco austerity? All of these things are muddled. And so I find it very annoying mm to be constantly labelled with, you know, commie Brexiteer because I was having to almost use labels which I hadn't myself used for a while, not because I felt I'd gone right wing, but because I think politics change. But positive thing, I know that by standing, I enabled people who were Labour voters or trade unionists or people who just consider themselves to be progressive left to vote for the Brexit party in the yeah. European elections. That will mean that people like, Paul Mason and so on will say that I was a useful idiot for Farage. Yeah. But it just gave people permission to say, well, when I voted leave, I wasn't a right winger. And now I'm going to vote for the Brexit party to reassert that I wanted to leave and I haven't changed my mind. And voting for the Brexit party is not voting for Nigel Farage's UKIP Mark II because this is a different organisation, which it was and is. And therefore, in that sense, I kind of think it was worth doing. You're listening to The Brendan O'Neill Show. Subscribe now so that you never miss an episode. And it would be great if you could give us a rating and maybe even a review. That is a really good way to help new listeners discover the show. In relation to the left thing, I mean, it, it can become a bit of a tick where, you know, you and I come from a left-wing background. I think we probably both consider ourselves still left-wing, although everyone tells us we're far right or whatever else they want to say. But I think, it, you know, there is always the danger that you can become like a bit repetitive in, say, in saying, I'm left, I'm left, I'm left, and it, too defensive. Yeah, yeah. But for me, the important thing about at least remembering the fact that Euroscepticism used to be predominantly a left-wing value and that you had people like Tony Benn and Barbara Castle and Peter Shaw and Michael Foote and then through to the modern times with people like the trade unions against the European Union, Paul Embry, Eddie Dempsey and others like that. I think for me, the important aspect of, of at least touching upon that is just raising the question of why the left came to into existence in the first place, which yeah. was, in my view, entirely about democracy. Because the left as an idea 
whether you want to say it, it's still relevant or not, the left as an idea was, th- was that it would give voice to people who didn't have a voice, not in the sense of speaking for them, but allowing them to speak for themselves and to agitate for themselves and to represent themselves through the democratic process. So that's one of the things I found so depressing about the past three and a half years, although I'm sure I'll get over it, is the way in which being left wing has shifted from meaning you give voice to ordinary people over experts and ordinary people over priests and ordinary people over those who think they know better, aristocrats and all the rest of it, towards the opposite, which is, you know, trust the experts, listen to people who've got PhDs. And and so that shift, I think, is is really worrying. I thought it was really brought home by the release of of Mike Lee's rather good film, Peter Lou, on the 200th anniversary. And then I spoke at a, a Leavers of Manchester event in St. Peter's Square where mm-hmm. the Peterloo massacre took place. And what you realize is that 200 years ago, those who would have considered themselves the very early version of the left would have the, been the people saying, you know, let the working man have a voice equal to everyone else's. And then you fast forward 200 years and you realize that those people who consider themselves left we're saying the opposite of that. So I think it's worth, in terms of the reckoning and in terms of the yeah. getting the balance right, it's worth historically establishing that the left existed for that purpose. And if it no longer plays that purpose, then it has no right whatsoever to ask, why are working class people voting for right wing parties? Why are they turning to Nigel Farage, who promises to uphold their democratic vote? Why did they turn in their millions across the red wall to Boris Johnson when he offered to recognize their political agency? So I think the left has got itself in a real bind in relation to the question of democracy in particular. Exactly, because I think the reason why it's worth remembering that left historical origin of the, the, the demand for democratic accountability and its relationship to the European Union is because precisely as you said, we've started to realise that democracy is not as deeply embedded in contemporary society as we thought. So, of course, nobody thought that you were going to have to go around saying to people, well, you do know that when the vote was brought in for the working classes that people said, were even working men, people, women, that they shouldn't have the vote because they couldn't read or write and they were therefore not educated enough. And now you're saying Mm -hmm. these people are not educated enough to vote to know what they're voting for. These arguments we thought had been dealt with and then they weren't. And it was the left, I mean, historically progressive left-wing forces that had made those arguments against that kind of elitism. So I think that's a perfectly important thing to connect to. But I also think it's worth saying that, I mean, it might've been a different story, by the way, and I didn't do the great men or women of history moment, but, you know, Bob Crow would have been an important voice in this. And in a way, yeah. his untimely death as a trade union leader, leader of the RMT, it left a, a gap because yeah. he was a well-respected, well-renowned, and by the way, he he had meetings with and you know was on platforms with Nigel Farage on occasion yeah. and kind of could see that there was some relationship there. And I do think that it's a shame that that union voice didn't become more to the fore. I, I really want to commend those trade unionists who did argue for this but one of the reasons why that matters is because god isn't it absolutely amazing that the left today trade unionists today think that there would be no trade union rights Mm. without the european Mm. union (laughs) and i think that that's why you want to go i'm on the left you know when you want to go because obviously a lot of people who may be tory or skeptics are not enthusiasts for trade unions or strike action or whatever. And you, I want to go, you know, without those trade unions, we wouldn't have any rights. And actually those right-wing Eurosceptics are a little bit anxious because they, they say workers' rights won't be guaranteed by the EU, but when you remind them what might guarantee them might be strikes at home, they go a bit pale, you know what I mean? Because it's a bit like, <laughs> oh, well, we don't mean that. And I really think it's important that we recognise those people who really put up a good fight. And so I want, I want in a way to reclaim the left's... Yeah part of that discussion because i think it's a useful one that that completes the big picture in terms of uh, of democracy the other thing was is that one of the things i really enjoyed doing um over in the european union was finding a secret pot of money where you get publications made and we brought one out called um left-wing arguments for sovereignty which i really enjoyed getting <laughs> published which was 12 essays actually international essays as well from left-wing eurosceptics and i didn't want that to be just like a badge you know i'm left-wing But it was as a counter to this argument that we should not take any notice of the Leave vote because it's a right-wing Trumpite 
concocted by Bannon in a secret bunker along with, you know, alt-right people wearing white hoods. I mean, every single yeah. conspiracy, you know, with Putin pulling the street. I mean, you know, you couldn't make it up. I wanted to say, actually, there's a long history here of Labour and left-wing thinking in relation to national sovereignty that is not right-wing nationalist. And there are, of course, right-wing nationalist movements growing around Europe, which I'm scared of, don't mm-hmm. get me wrong. I mean, there are nasty elements. And I wanted to be able to show that you couldn't lump everyone in with those because they wanted to leave the European Union or voted leave in 2016. So these things, I think, are not about saying you're left or right, but actually ensuring that people have a full picture of what drove that leave vote. 